This micro lecture is on biomass to parts. Today's fun bioenergy fact is about plankton powered solar cells, specifically a type of plankton known as diatoms. The same plankton that live in the ocean and are eaten by whales have become an interesting new bioenergy platform because it turns out that solar cells can be constructed out of diatoms that have been designed to build shells out of semiconductor materials. By controlled feeding of alternative substrates such as soluble germanium or titanium to living diatom cells, semiconductor materials can be inserted into the diatom biosilica. This process imparts optoelectronic properties to diatom shells that allow it to be used in solar cells. This is a very neat idea for sustainable electronics, so if you have a chance, please visit the attached link and learn more about it. Please take a moment to review this week's learning objectives. This week, we will be covering chemical conversions, our third biomass conversion pathway type. There are a lot of chemical conversion products. They range from cell wall polymers like cellulose and lignin to much smaller things like sugars and chemicals like furfural. We will not be able to cover all of these, but it is important to appreciate the wide range of commodity, specialty, and fine chemicals that can be produced from biomass using chemical conversion processes. Remember, from a chemical perspective, chemical conversions are like the knife, as opposed to the thermal hammer. Chemical conversions are more sensitive to the type of biomass, but they are accurate and precise like a knife and as a result, they can produce a very high-quality, predictable product. This pathway is important because we can expose biomass to many different kinds of chemicals and conditions and get it to turn into a variety of things. It is important that you have a general appreciation for what some of those chemicals, conditions, and steps are so that you can better understand the developments in the bioenergy industry. In general, biomass is broken down into its parts using acids, bases, solvents, or enzymes. It is interesting to consider that we have been chemically breaking biomass into its parts for well over a hundred years, so a lot of these ideas are not new, but back then they didn't have the technology we have today, so we can do a lot more with those ideas. It is very likely that from time to time I will mention a chemical or a process that you have never heard before. If that happens and it is not explained in a slide, please look it up on the internet to familiarize yourself so that you are not confused. Chemical processes get complex because unlike thermal processes, they have a lot of steps. To help with this complexity, it is important to remember what biomass looks like cellularly and chemically. Most of the time we practice chemical conversions, we are trying to isolate and collect the elementary fibrils shown in this image. Those elementary fibrils are the same thing as fibers, and these fibers are used to make paper, and they are composed of cellulose. So all of the processes discussed in this biomass to parts lecture are related to removing all of the cellular stuff around the fibers so that we can have piles of just the pure fiber to work with. Like we previously discussed, we have been using chemical conversions to turn biomass into useful products for a very, very long time. The conversion of wood chips into cellulose pulp for paper is a chemical conversion known as pulping. You can pulp any kind of plant biomass to produce cellulose, but not all cellulose is good for making paper. This is a figure that shows more of the details associated with the pulping process. Wood comes in, it is mixed with reactive chemicals, and then the cell wall is broken down into its pieces. The fiber is kept, and the rest is sent to a recovery boiler where the non-fibrous cell matter and the reacted chemicals are burned together to recover the reactive chemicals. Then the reactive chemicals are recycled, reactivated, and sent back to be mixed with fresh wood. There are two main types of wood pulping, an acid process known as sulfite pulping and a base process known as craft pulping. They are very similar in many ways but different in some important ways as well. The sulfite process produces wood pulp that is almost pure cellulose fiber by using various salts of sulfurous acid to extract the lignin from wood chips in large pressure vessels called digesters. These pulping chemicals are known as liquor. The pulp is in contact with the pulping chemicals for 4 to 14 hours and at temperatures ranging from 130 to 160 degrees Celsius. 
The spent cooking liquor from sulfite pulping is usually called red liquor or sulfite liquor, and it can be burned in a recovery boiler to recover the inorganic chemicals for reuse, or it can be neutralized to recover the useful byproducts of pulping. The opportunity to recover useful byproducts from the spent cooking liquor through neutralizing is an interesting aspect of sulfite pulping. It also generates a higher quality lignin and has a potentially higher pulp yield depending on how it's done. However, the cellulose fiber it generates is often weaker, so it is mostly a specialty pulping process today compared to craft pulping. Outright acid hydrolysis using hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid is another option very similar to sulfite pulping. You basically mix biomass with acid and then increase the temperature. This separates the fiber part from the other parts, and then you can collect the fiber part and use it for producing sugars. After the fiber part is removed from the acid bath, the acid can be recovered and reused. The image shown is a flow diagram that explains how this works. The craft process produces wood pulp that is almost pure cellulose fiber as well, but instead it uses a mixture of sodium hydroxide and sodium sulfide, known as white liquor, to break the bonds that link lignin to the cellulose. Like sulfide pulping, this is done in large pressure vessels called digesters. The pulp is in contact with the pulping chemicals for two to three hours, and at temperatures ranging from 170 to 180 degrees Celsius. Under these conditions, lignin and hemicellulose degrade to give fragments that are soluble in the strongly basic liquid. The solid pulp is collected and washed, and the spent cooking liquor, known as black liquor, is concentrated and burned in a recovery boiler to recover the inorganic chemicals for reuse. The craft process is by far the most popular commercial pulping method. It works on many different kinds of biomass, it generates a very strong pulp, and in many ways it is a less complicated process than sulfite pulping because of the materials and emissions considerations. Ammonia fiber explosion, also known as AFEX, is another base-driven process to reduce biomass to its parts. One of its strengths is that it is fairly simple. All you do is soak the biomass in ammonia while the temperature and pressure are increased. Once you get to the desired pressure, the pressure is rapidly released, resulting in an explosive expansion. This explosion literally tears the cellulose fiber from the lignin and leaves you with a biomass that is much, much more degradable and digestible than it was before the AFEX treatment. This process does not leave you with a pile of pure cellulose fiber, but its speed and simplicity make it a good process for a variety of small-scale bioenergy ideas. Organosolve pulping has been around since the 1970s, and instead of acids and bases, it uses solvents. Remember, a solvent is a chemical that can be used to dissolve something and turn it into a liquid solution. Unlike an acid or a base, solvents don't generally damage or modify the chemistry of the thing that dissolves. They just rearrange the molecules so that they can become a solution. Just like normal pulping, in organosolve pulping, biomass is mixed with the solvent in a reactor at a temperature of between 140 to 220 Celsius for several hours. This causes the lignin and the cellulose fiber to be separated, and because no acid or base modifications occur, the lignin or cellulose or hemicellulose are extremely pure, much, much purer than can be achieved with normal pulping. Solvents used include acetone, methanol, ethanol, butanol, ethylene glycol, formic acid, acetic acid, and others. The major disadvantage of organosolve pulping is the pressure. Solvents tend to have very low boiling points, so when you get them hot, it takes a lot of pressure to contain them, and this makes organosolve pulping very expensive. Solvents that don't require high pressures and that don't dissolve in water are preferred. At the moment, ethanol and butanol are two of the most popular. One of the most fascinating recent developments in the chemical separation of cell wall components has been something called ionic liquids. Ionic liquids are generally liquid organic salts. Any salt that can melt without decomposing or vaporizing is usually called an ionic liquid. Ionic liquids are outrageous solvents, capable of dissolving a wide variety of things very, very quickly. The image shown is of a cotton ball being dissolved in an ionic liquid at room temperature in five seconds. Think about how many hours the pulping processes took, and you can see why ionic liquids are so exciting. 
The problem with them is that they are very expensive chemicals, and we do not have very many efficient methods for recovering them after they have been used to dissolve biomass. Fortunately, this is changing, and an increasing number of scientists are developing methods for recovering most of the ionic liquids used in the conversion so that they can be reused. This will be a technology to watch closely. Another very exciting solvent is something called gamma valerolactone, or GVL. What is exciting about it is that, like ionic liquids, it can be used to dissolve biomass into its parts at fairly low temperatures and pressures. Not quite as low as ionic liquids, but much better than traditional pulping. As a bonus, GVL is also easy to recycle, and it's much cheaper than ionic liquids. However, the most interesting thing about GVL is that a certain amount of it is actually produced during the biomass decomposition process. So it's like breaking the biomass down with a biomass breakdown product. This kind of chemical looping is a chemical engineering dream because it allows the process to be more flexible and economic than normal. The only other chemical that has shown this type of promise is methanol, but to use methanol requires much higher temperatures and pressures than GVL needs, so GVL is a significant advancement. Genetically engineering crops to decompose themselves after they are harvested is not practiced by very many people, but it's hard not to be a little excited about it. Enzymes are a very expensive chemical because they have to be harvested from microbes or plants or animals and then purified. The traditional approach has always been to add enzymes to the biomass and let the enzymes start breaking things down. However, if the plant that needs to be broken down has been genetically engineered to have the desired enzyme, then you can skip buying the expensive enzyme and doing all the processing, and that would be great. A company called Agravita is working on this idea right now. The crops produce dormant enzymes embedded within the plant. These embedded dormant enzymes are activated under specific post-harvest conditions, and the activated enzymes degrade the cell wall. This approach greatly reduces enzyme, energy, chemical, and capital costs normally associated with using biomass for bioenergy. Another way to use enzymes is to get a fungus to excrete them for you. When this is used to break down biomass, it is known as biopulping. Currently, biopulping treats wood chips with a natural wood decaying fungus prior to mechanical pulping. This process saves substantial amounts of electricity, reduces the environmental impacts, and enhances the economic competitiveness. It is not really done at commercial scale yet, but it is a very interesting approach that is already somewhat employed in the production of silage for livestock. This is an area with a lot of potential as long as the proposed application is okay with the long wait times required for the microbe chemicals to do their work. When you have an opportunity, please visit the attached link on biochar supercapacitors. The image looks complex and probably a little confusing, but what it is trying to communicate is that wood anatomy is showing a lot of potential for use in supercapacitors if the wood is very carefully turned into biochar. This is exciting because supercapacitors are a booming industry, and wood is much more sustainable and economic than the current materials we rely on. Biochar supercapacitors have demonstrated promising capacity and durability which is comparable to existing advanced carbon materials. Notably, biochars have good conductivity, electrochemical stability, and an interesting pore network that makes them a promising energy and environmental material. This will be an area to watch in the future.